Did I tell you about the the t-shirt study of symmetrical men? Oh, that's a funny one. <laughs> yeah, so we know that one of the things that signifies physical beauty is symmetry, right? Because, and the reason for that is that all things considered, symmetrical people are more healthy than asymmetrical people. Asymmetry indicates that something's gone wrong somewhere in the process of development. So, we like symmetry in beauty. And, uh, and that's fine, and that's all the way across the animal kingdom. So butterflies, there are butterflies that won't mate with another butterfly if it deviates from symmetry some absurdly tiny amount. Like, really, it's, it's, micro, it's micro measurement deviation. I guess they have a butterfly template, and if, you know, if the, the potential mating butterfly doesn't match, it's like, flitter off, you know. <laughs> You're not getting anywhere. So... So that's fine, but symmetry, so uh, this researcher, God only knows what possessed him, he took a bunch of men, ranging from symmetrical to asymmetrical, you know, judged by a panel, and then he had them shower, and then he had them wear a t-shirt for like four hours, and then all of them, and then he gave these t-shirts to women and said, okay, rate these, the, the, the scent of the t-shirt from, you know, positive to negative. It's like, well, the women overwhelmingly preferred the symmetrical guys. <laughs> So, yeah, no kidding, eh? So you just bloody well never know what's, what's behind that attraction. You know, we know something. Symmetry is a big one, but there's a bunch of other ones, too. Yeah? Yeah, I was just wondering how that would correlate with, I know, um, attraction to smells also have to do with um, your, like, optimal mate. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of things. So yeah, so, um, ha, here's another study. This is a cool one. So... This is one of the few psychological facts. We don't have many psychological facts. You know, we have a lot of hypotheses about things, but this is as close to a fact as we've ever got. So, back, you know, decades ago, the Israelis' children were raised in kibbutzim, and those were basically, um, they were basically daycare for kids, group daycare. But they, the kids were more separated from their parents than they might be in the regular daycare. Anyways... All the Israeli kids were in these kibbutzes. And so then we have detailed marriage records of the kids. And so you know that people very seldom marry their siblings. And they're very seldomly in a sexual relationship with their siblings. And you might say, well, why is that? You know, and it's the case across cultures with, with very specific exceptions. Like often high-ranking nobility can, you know, they have an option. But generally speaking, there's a powerful incest taboo as well as between parents and children. So, so some researcher decided, well, how do you know who your sibling is? You know, roughly speaking, what exactly is it that's not turning you on, let's say? Well, so they checked out the kibbutzim records and they found that Israeli children who were raised in the same kibbutz never married each other. Whatever happened seemed to, you know, it was as if that close, close, Contact in the very early years triggered whatever the sibling anti-response is, and that was that. It's probably smell. That would be my guess. Now, there's also another study. One of the things they found with mice, I hope it's mice, is that mice will not mate... Is that right? I can't... Okay, I'm going to garble this up, but it doesn't matter because the point, the underlying point is valid even though I'm going to mess up the details. Animal studies indicated, if I remember correctly, that mice will not mate with other mice who have an RH factor that would increase the probability of a miscarriage. And neither will women. So women, well, not with mice, obviously, but <laughs> women, women do not like the smell of men who have RH factors that in combination with theirs would produce suboptimal um, offspring. And when you ask them why they don't like the smell, they say... It smells like my brother. Something like that. So, anyways. So, anyways, that's quite remarkable. Now, back to the rats and the expectancy model. Okay, so, we already know that you can get an orienting response out of a human being if something deviates from expectancy. Now, people started studying this in rats. And the original conceptualization was expectation. So, you have an expectation of how the world is going to lay itself out. That's your model. And then if the world deviates from that, then you have an orienting reflex. And what the orienting reflex does is protect you from predation. That's the first 
level of the orienting response. It's really, really primitive. It's, it's mediated only by a few neuronal connections, so it's unbelievably rapid. And then after that, there's anxiety and the proclivity to explore. That both gets activated. So it's first protective. Then you orient towards the... Imagine you're walking down the street and you hear a really loud noise behind you. It's like really loud, so it startles you. Well, you go into a crouch so that it, if a tiger had jumped on your back, it would be hard for it to get your neck. And then, you know, tenths of a second later, you'll turn, you'll, assuming you don't get attacked by a tiger, you'll swivel and turn and orient all your senses towards the locale that was specified by the sound, because you have stereo, a stereo auditory system and you can localize events in space using that. So you orient towards it, that's part of the orienting reflex. It's a reflex, it's not voluntary. So, and then, once you've got your eyes trained on it and your ears, then you start to explore it, and then you might get, you might freeze, you might get out of there, which is a panic response, that's another thing that can be triggered by the orienting reflex, different circuit, or you might think, well, what's going on over there? It looks interesting, and then you go approach it. Now, those two the exploratory part is mediated in part by the hypothalamus, which is a very, very old system, and it has a whole section, about half of it, is devoted to the circuitry that you would use to figure out what was going on if something that you didn't understood happened. And then you have a whole other circuit that's hippocampal and amygdalic that regulates the exploratory circuit that says, be careful because while you're gathering information you might get killed. And the anxiety circuit takes primacy, generally speaking, over the exploratory circuit. And the reason for that is, you don't want to get information and be dead. So, caution is the watchword. Now, the other thing that you might think about, which is an extremely useful thing to think about. Okay, let's go back to that diagram I showed you with the hierarchy. Right? So, you've got the motor actions at the bottom, and you've got the high-level abstractions at the top. Okay, so, you're tickling the baby, and somebody comes home and says, if you tickle the baby this way, then the baby has more fun. And so, how do you respond to that? Well, maybe you're a little peeved because you're doing perfectly fine with this baby and, you know, someone's coming and altering your tickling micro-personality. And, you know, if you're irritable, you'll say, well, why don't you just go off and find a baby of your own to play with? <laughs> and, if you're not, and if you're not that irritable, you might say, well, okay, show me what to do. You know, there'll be a tinge of negative emotion there, generally speaking, depending on how the person has approached it. But... Your self-concept can probably handle a micro-change to your tickling routine. Okay, so that's going to produce only a little bit of anxiety and irritation. And the reason for that is that the threat to you is proportionate to the magnitude of the system that's being modified by the challenge. 